introduce two panelists at a time so I don't have to get up and down. We can speak this alone, okay? So we're going to start with senior editor Margaret Kimberly, whose weekly column, Freedom Rider, has garnered national and international attention. She is a New York-based writer and an activist for peace and justice issues. Margaret is on the steering committee of the United National Anti-War Coalition. She has been a columnist for Black Agenda Report since its inception and was for four years the weekly columnist for Black Commentator. Uh, she was with the Black Commentator along with Bruce Dixon and the founder, Black, I mean, uh, Glenn Ford. Her work has also appeared in the Dallas Morning News, the Chicago Defender, and on websites such as Alternet, Counter Punch, Thomas Paine, etc., etc. Okay, and then we're going to move to Danny Haifung. Um, he is a Black Agenda Black Agenda columnist, and he is also an Asian activist and political an analyst in the Boston area. His recent article, 10 Examples of How U.S. Imperialism Continues to Kill the People and Planet, noted, quote, what has been called a race to the bottom by some scholars is really a permanent crisis in the system as a whole. And so I bring to you Margaret Kimberly and Danny Haifon. Thank you. I'm just gonna sit here and remember the cramp. Good afternoon, oh, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, coming and uh, dealing with our too small space. But anyway, I will get to the point. Uh, resisting Trump and exposing the Democrats. Uh, we've heard a lot about resistance ever since uh, the night of November 8th, which was Election Day. Uh, that day, Donald Trump upended the political world with the upset of Hillary Clinton. She had the backing of corporate media, nearly all Democratic Party <laughs> elected officials, and even of some Republicans who decided to live with her because they thought Trump was going to lose. She raised a billion dollars in her campaign effort, and that alone is proof of support from most of the ruling class, in the, or one percent. I admit I didn't see this coming either, but once it happened, I've been on point with one theme. That night I wrote a column called Dumping the Democrats for Good. That is the only way to resist Trump. Now, in, in retrospect, I believe that Donald Trump won enough votes for an electoral college victory when he announced he was going to build a wall on the border with Mexico. He went straight to the heart of the matter for many white Americans. It turns out they didn't care uh, as much about Republican Party orthodoxy as we were led to believe. They didn't care about tax cuts for the rich or wars of aggression. They wanted a country where they were clearly on top, that is to say, made great again. They wanted, and one can't argue against it, the return of a day when they could depend on living wage jobs. Of course, making America great again is dangerous to many other people. A few days ago, I saw a video um, on social media um, about an, an undocumented uh, Latino man, I think in Florida. Anyway, this man was riding a bike and he was hit by a car. So he's lying in the street, injured. The police come. Instead of calling an ambulance, they start asking him, are you legal? <laughs> Unfortunately, he was undocumented and was deported because he got hit by a car. And this is just one example of what has been unleashed in the Trump uh, victory. But this is where things also get a little tricky. Uh, as we pointed out in uh, Black Agenda Report last week, Obama also ramped up deportations and can be truly called the deporter in chief. It's true the new attorney general is open about maintaining mass incarceration, but Obama didn't do anything to dismantle that system either. So, but despite the, the doom and the gloom, we have an opportunity 
uh, with the Trump victory. The trap of black people within the confines of the Democratic Party always brings us disaster. I recall the near euphoria when Bill Clinton was elected after three successive Republican victories. But what did we get? Welfare so-called reform, which impoverished millions of people, mass incarcerations, and the beginning of Wall Street being given a free hand to create a bubble which decimated black people financially. Obama came into office, swept into victory. Did he overturn any of those policies or George W. Bush's policies? Obamacare, the one thing that's always shoved in our faces, if you ever question Obama, but Obamacare, but Obamacare. <laughs> it was a Republican plan, bailed out the health insurance and big pharma industries, which are the cause of all our health care woes. He made it clear that the people who loved him most were not going to get any consideration from him. We got a lot of scolding, um, but that was all. Wars of aggression against nations we used to support, and nothing else but a black face in the high place. But the Democrats were on shaky ground. The Obama team's marketing got him into office but, and covered a multitude of sins. But since that time, since 2008, the Democrats have lost the House, the Senate, control of most states. Their fundraising goes almost entirely to presidential campaigns. They don't even go through the motions of fighting Republicans for control of state legislatures. And Republicans then drew district lines which created more safe seats than the House for them. So the Democrats don't care if abortion rights are taken away. They don't care about voter ID laws and voter suppression, which steal votes from black people. Hillary Clinton probably lost the key states of Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania because of voter suppression, but she has said nothing about it until a couple of days ago. And the rest of the Democrats have, are equally silent. Uh, around Inauguration Day, Congressman John Lewis was asked if he thought Trump was a legitimate president. And he said no. Did he say he was illegitimate because of the Electoral College? No. Did he say he was illegitimate because he owed his victory to black voter suppression? No. Mr. Civil Rights Icon said that Trump was illegitimate because of Russia. Russia, <laughs> Russia, Russia. Which is all they can muster to hide their failure and keep the war party in business. It must be clearly stated as often as possible that the Democrats are to blame for Trump's victory. They know how to get votes. All they have to do is give people what they want. Minimum wage increase, living wage jobs, an end to the $1 trillion college debt industry, Medicare for all. But they don't offer any of these policies because the people who give them money don't want it to happen. And they don't want to bite the hands that feed them. So now they're using Trump as a punching bag and fundraising poster child. I don't think they really want to impeach him uh, because Vice President Pence is seen as being less dangerous and won't keep uh, frightened voters in line with the Democrats who keep failing them. What have they done since Election Day? They have refused to even give the appearance that they are willing to push for even meager reforms. Look at the race for the DNC chairmanship. Keith Ellison is not as progressive as advertised. Yes, he endorsed Bernie Sanders, but that's about all. So instead of letting him win the seat and give the appearance of giving something to Sanders supporters, they instead recruit Tom Perez to keep selling what voters aren't buying, to make it clear that the Democratic Party is not changing anything. As Nancy Pelosi said, we don't need to change anything. I don't know if anybody else, anybody else saw that. But anyway, at, at this point in the conversation, um, we always hear about lesser evilism and the Republicans are so terrible and third parties are just spoilers. But I, I say, um, First of all, the Democrats can't even win anything anymore, so they can't even give you a, a semblance of lesser evilism. Um, so we have to talk about replacing them and uh, having a true workers' party, true peace party. So let's put the Democrats out of their misery. Let's pull the plug <laughs> and get them out of our lives. But that will require serious resistance against them first and not Trump first. But this is going to be hard because it's been a long time since we had a mass movement, and that's what uh, really brings about change and resistance. Um, you know, these debates aren't really new. In the, the 60s, there were debates about um, should Lyndon Johnson be confronted because he'd been so good to black people? Can you criticize Dr. King because he's done so much? And there were debates, but there was always someone who said, hell yes, we can confront them. Uh, people didn't just uh, uh, shut up and, and go home, they actually did it because liberation was the goal. 
Fifty years later, we've gone backwards and we rely on discredited policies instead of our own power to liberate ourselves. I was struck uh, after election day that there was so little anger directed at the Democrats. Um, Trump being Trump is a target. It's, he's a hard target to ignore. I, I know that. But, um, uh, you know, he's always doing something. He's tweeting something crazy or pushes the president of Montenegro or doesn't know who Frederick Douglass is or puts his dumb son-in-law in charge of foreign policy. There's always something to pay attention to. But that should not uh, fool us. And uh, uh, lastly, um, I touched briefly on the Congressional Black Caucus when I mentioned John Lewis, but he's not alone. They are the worst hacks in the Democratic Party. They take their cues straight from uh, Democratic Party leadership. They don't even talk about black people anymore. If they're not talking about Russia, they're not talking about anything. So they have to be resisted first. They're the gatekeepers, these misleaders, and we've got to uh, get rid of them. Uh, you know, Trump, I'm not going to say that Trump is not bad for black people, not bad for the country. <laughs> Uh, so all of the things I mentioned are true, but they're not the worst thing affecting our lives. Police murder, incarceration, unemployment are all worse, and they weren't being addressed before he became president. So it's not uh, really a difference for us, for those people who are getting the worst treatment in the country. So resisting the Democrats first is essential because they brought all these calamities into our lives and there's no reason to believe that they will be any different. Thank you very much. Okay, so when I was here last year, I spoke a lot about ideology and how the struggle for social transformation in the mainland of imperialism partly depended upon the ideological development of oppressed people trapped within U.S. borders. The 2016 elections were beginning to pick up momentum, but it was unclear what direction they would go. Fast forward to the present, and I don't know about you all, but I'm exhausted. <laughs> the election of Donald Trump has presented both old and new challenges. It has created an almost circus-like political environment with dire consequences for the masses. What precipitated the circus show is a crisis of governance that has been intentionally misunderstood by U.S. imperialism's corporately owned media and political elite. To distort the crisis, a state of anti-Russian madness has been prescribed to medicate political consciousness in rapidly changing times. The rise of China has ex in Russia has exposed the bankruptcy of U.S. imperialism on all fronts. Economic crisis at home, an endless war abroad, has placed finance and monopoly capital in political disarray. Now, Donald Trump took advantage of the chaos. He spoke about jobs, he spoke about wars, and he spoke to the growing insecurities of white Americans of working and middle class status who no longer can rely on the wages of whiteness for guaranteed prosperity. <clears throat> the duopoly and its cap capitalist masters had no one to offer, indeed nothing to offer. So Trump rode in on his orange horse to become the head of state of imperialism. The ruling class do not want people in the United States to understand the context of the Trump presidency. It has reapplied Cold War fears with Russia as the prime target. Russia's geopolitical moves away from imperialism have been deemed just as criminal as China's economic supremacy. The U.S. does not depend as much on Russia in the economic sense, but it trembles in fear at the prospect of growing Russian economic activity across Eurasia. Yet provoking Russia militarily will lead to world war and this is a risk the ruling cl class appears willing to take. The anti-Russian narrative in the U.S. has only intensified since Hillary Clinton made the erroneous claim of Russian interference in the 2016 elections over a year ago. According to the U.S. ruling class and its intelligence officials, Russia promotes fake news to assist Donald Trump. Russian President Vladimir Putin is lurking in our social media and hacking his way through algorithms to smear the U.S. political system. <laughs> Russia is infecting minds with its Russia Today propaganda arm. The Ruskies have no regard for the damage they have caused to so-called U.S. democracy. Putin wants total control of the United States and will wield his most talented social media users to get the job done. This is what the corporate media sounds like these days. Of course, the U.S. ruling class does not want to talk about how U.S. intelligence already collects the numbers, the emails, and the calls 
of every single person in the world who uses a cell phone or a computer. They don't want to tell you about how the U.S. has interfered in every election in Russia since the Soviet Union fell, or how it has led bloody pro proxy wars and coups in over 50 countries in as many years. They don't want to discuss how Russia has absolutely nothing to do with the millions of incarcerated people in the U.S., or the fact that it is the U.S. monopoly capitalist economy, not the emerging capitalist economy of Russia, which has automated many of the jobs and siphoned much of the wealth that once belonged to a privileged sector of U.S. workers. No, it would rather attention be placed on the Russian boogeyman. Anti-Russian hysteria doesn't just distract the broad masses of people from the legitimate causes of the conditions afflicting the working and unemployed. It feeds into an atmosphere of war that strikes the very roots of the U.S. social order. Imperialism is the rule of monopoly and finance capital. <clears throat> this system has run its course. It cannot hold on to political legitimacy any more than it can spur economic development beyond the meager 1 to 2 percent growth calculated year after year. In a sense, war is all the system has left. And war is exactly what the ruling class will get with or without Trump. War with Russia is today's clarion call for, quote, American unity. In times of crisis, the U.S. imperial state has relied on war to bring about political and economic relief from domestic crisis. Every major U.S.-led war has in part been waged for this purpose. What differs now is that war with Russia could bring about the destruction of humanity. Scientists have confirmed that nuclear war could make the planet uninhabitable. What is also different about this current war drive with Russia is how it marks the historical conclusion of the current stage in the world imperialist order as a whole. When the U.S. threatened nuclear war with the atomic bombing of Japan in 1945 and the Cuban Missile Crisis almost two decades later, the world was in the midst of a transition from Western monopoly capitalism to proletarian socialism. Revolutions in the Soviet Union, Vietnam, and Cuba, to name a few, threatened to undo the very notion of private property. And while U.S. and Western backlash nearly eliminated the socialist bloc in 1991, <laughs> the imperialist order entered a transition stage of its own that some call neoliberalism. Neoliberalism has greatly expanded the reach of capitalism's tentacles and widened the impact of capitalist crisis since its inception in the late 1970s. Neoliberalism has unleashed unfettered capitalist production by imposing economic stagnation on participating countries. Meanwhile, China's socialist model has paved a different path one marked by unprecedented growth and poverty reduction. China has understandably attracted underdeveloped nations so desperately seeking to escape the neo-colonial impoverishment um, of the U.S. and West. Russia has grown close to China, providing both countries with much needed assistance in the way of constructing a multipolar economic arrangement based on the principles of sovereignty and mutually beneficial cooperation. According to the logic of neoliberal capital, only war with Russia and China can save the system from itself. This conclusion stems from the fact that neoliberal capital is not growing, it is contracting. 80% of workers are near poor in the U.S., while six mega billionaires hold ownership over half of the planet's wealth. Concentrated profit does not mean that all is well with the ruling class. Internal contradictions are eating the capitalist system alive. Neither finance capital nor its monopoly investors can arrest the resultant decline. The growth of technology to speed up production and profit has left millions in permanent unemployment. A high-tech system of production is an expensive system of production, requiring lower wages and debt to absorb the falling rate of profit. Global overproduction has thus developed alongside mass misery. Such conditions are the root of mass incarceration, where millions of mostly black and poor workers are warehoused in cages because there is nothing on the outside that the system can offer. They are also at the root of mass surveillance, as a system must keep tabs on an increasingly restless population and justify infringements on civil liberties as necessary counter-terror measures. The war on terror and drugs have been prerequisites toward keeping the population scared and its attention away from the U.S. capitalist overlords who fund and support drug trafficking and terrorism for political gain. And when all else fails, blame Russia. The struggle against neoliberal capital and anti-Russia hysteria is a struggle to transform and revolutionize society. This struggle requires both political organization and ideological development. There will be no revolution without revolutionary thought and no revolution without revolutionary action. 
All too often, the left is debating which one is the most important for the future success of a revolutionary movement. <coughs> the answer is both together. For most, this explanation is understandably too broad to inform individual political energy. Liberal thought and action thus becomes attractive because it hides behind the cloak of the possible and pragmatic. It is easier to think in terms of electoral politics than in global struggle. It is far more simple to advocate for a cooperative economy or universal basic income without spelling out the context that prevents their formation. In order for any material victories to be won on a mass scale in this period, the victors must understand the world in which they fight. Conscious struggle has brought about deep and meaningful changes in recent years. Mumia Abu-Jamal is now receiving hep C treatment after years of struggle with the state of Pennsylvania. The release of Chelsea Manning and Oscar Rivera Lopez also comes to mind. <clears throat> Solidarity with Cuba freed the Cuban Five and has given the socialist nation more opportunities to develop its economy. But these victories have come in the midst of great costs. A movement for social transformation in the U.S. is still yet to be born, as the presence of dozens of political prisoners and the ongoing U.S. blockade against Cuba reminds us. Not once did I mention the Democratic or Republican parties. Both parties have done their part in the, to create the crisis before us. A rejection of the two parties means an embrace of the struggle against imperialism worldwide. It means that the nations with the U.S. targets on their backs should be seen as potential allies. Yes, this includes Russia and Syria. It includes the left movements in Latin America. In the spirit of Malcolm X, the Black Liberation Movement, and the historic anti-imperialist struggle around the globe, the time has come to search for real bonds of solidarity around the world to aid in the struggle against white supremacy, capitalism, and empire in the U.S. and West. Let no one, not even those who call themselves the left, tell you otherwise. That's it. Thank you. Our next two speakers are Glenn Ford and Daoud and Grace. Um, Glenn Ford a certified elder of black journalism uh, is <laughs> I borrowed that I think from you <laughs> is the executive editor of Black Agenda Report that was launched in 2006 along with Bruce Dixon and Margaret Kimberly. Ford's distinguished long career include correspondent with the national with the I'm sorry with the mutual Black Network, co-producer and host of America's Black Forum. Ford is producer and co-host of Black Agenda Radio and appears as a weekly commentary on The Real News. And along with Glenn is my good friend, Daoud Andres, who is a Haitian activist and he works with Kamakota. So our next two speakers, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to be somewhat brief because uh, many of you have already heard me uh, talk about uh, the Democrats being the main party uh, today of the ruling class and talk about uh, the reasons that the Democrats in particular uh, are on the war path. But I wanted to discuss uh, why Black Agenda Report uh, is treating uh, this uh, issue of war and peace uh, so prominently as, as, as the critical issue uh, today, I mean right now. Uh, all of you know that Black Agenda Report doesn't confine itself to the black part of town in terms of the kind of work that we do. Uh, we are internationalists, all of us, and, and that's because uh, the whole world is the human community. Uh, but we do have a special <clears throat> mission. Uh, if we claim uh, that we are an authentic voice of the black uh, left, uh, then we have to be very tenacious about examining the contradictions of the black American polity in particular. And the only way that we can do that and not be uh, parochial or narrow in our uh, approach uh, is to place the black American situation, the black American struggle, uh, into its global and historical context. We feel that is part of our special responsibility. And so we understand 
that our black misleadership class is not a peculiar black problem, but that they are in many ways simply agents of larger forces. And specifically, they are agents of the democratic faction of the ruling class, which is now uh, the main and most aggressive war party. Therefore, if we are going to participate in the fight against the U.S. ruling class and the fight against U.S. imperialism, and if we're going to be on the side of people all over the world who are fighting U.S. imperialism, we have to fight most intensely our own black misleadership class. Uh, we can't defend our own people if we don't fight this corrupt black misleadership class, which tries to serve itself and its very narrow interests by serving the interests of capital. Uh, today, the Democrats are whipping up a war fever uh, such that even old people like me have never experienced it in terms of the, de de uh, the decibel level, the madness, uh, the craziness of it. And the black misleadership class is whooping it up, it's hooping and hollering as loud as any of the rest of them. They're all screaming about the Russians as if that's all black folks uh, have to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> and so even though Barack Obama is gone and everybody at Black Agenda Report is so glad <laughs> that Barack Obama <laughs> is gone. <laughs> And one of the reasons that we are so glad he's gone is because we had eight years of a very unique experience uh, for black folks. Uh, here we have uh, black people uh, shown in so many ways uh, to be the most pro-peace constituency in the country. Uh, uh, but that, that, that is not necessarily the case. We can't say definitively if that uh, remains the case after eight years of Barack Obama in the White House after eight years of folks uh, feeling an intimacy, a closeness, an identification uh, with not only the head of U.S. imperialism, uh, but it will have to, history will, will uh, I'm sure, say, uh, one of the most aggressive and militaristic uh, presidents uh, and heads of U.S. imperialism uh, ever. Uh, so this is not good for anybody's psyche, uh, but it certainly was a pollutant uh, in terms of the black experience. So here we are, uh, finally rid of <clears throat> Obama, and we get this uh, anti-Russian uh, fever, and we have people like Maxine uh, Waters, who uh, many of us had a soft spot for uh, in the past, uh, now screaming about Vladimir Putin and Trump as if they're incestuous kinds of cousins <laughs> or something like that. Today, uh, black people are screaming against Russians thinking that somehow they are doing damage to Trump and, and not understanding the damage that is being done uh, to our movement, uh, to our fortunes, uh, to the struggle uh, for a just world. And that is really a disaster. Uh, the historically most pro-peace constituency in the country uh, is now in danger uh, of being co-opted by the war party and everybody ought to be especially upset about that. So we have to do real battle with this black misleadership class on the peace front. And we're going to have to give greater scrutiny also uh, to black formations uh, in the movement. And, I, I, I mean especially to Black Lives Matter, a, a young formation uh, a, that is so Im, important uh, to, uh, to what we thought was the possibilities of, of there being a new uh, period of intense uh, political struggle in black America. But we all know that U.S. wars abroad are also wars against the poor here at home. Dr. King said that 50 years ago. And we all know that the mechanisms of repression that are used against black people in general and against dissidents in particular have become far more effective and far more pervasive under America's endless war on terror. 
Uh, but I think that there is something at stake here that is just as critical. And, and that is the harm that is done to the spirit of solidarity with oppressed people everywhere and solidarity with the victims of US imperialism by this immersion in war fever and the participation in this war fever by some of the most prominent uh, black Americans. If we don't have solidarity with other oppressed people, then we can expect no solidarity from others in our own struggle. And I'm talking about black folks. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Daoud Andre. Like Nelly said, I'm an activist in the Haitian community over here in New York. I was born in Haiti, but I've been living in this country for a very long time. And uh, I'm very happy to see so many folks packed into this room for this uh, session. You know, uh, resisting Trump, exposing the Democrats. And uh, like for many of our people, we say, well, what's the difference between Trump and the Democrats? Because from the perspective of our country, <coughs> uh, we had a from the time we became an independent country, we have been equally attacked by Democrats and Republicans. And sometimes it's very difficult for us to uh, understand the notion of progressive Americans <laughs> in the context that, you know, when the bombs are dropping, you know, <laughs> what do you do? What do you say? Where is it coming from? And uh, 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 the word solidarity popped up many times, but for me, it's beyond solidarity, the way we have to understand uh, the work that has to be done, the struggle that has to be waged against this entire thing, everything I say that we see here. In, in the government, in the corporations, in the, what, what's called the system that oppresses not just people over here, but all over here in the world. We have to look that it's one struggle, whether it's people that are in Haiti, in Africa, in the Middle East, in, in Asia, and also over here, people who, in, feel that this cannot continue. He, the brother he, Raymond Nat Turner, who he started the program with beautiful poetry for us, carries the name Nat Turner. But Nat Turner, this rebellion, this the uprising that happened, attempt, we believe, at revolution, just the same revolution that happened in Haiti. I don't know how many of you know that this happened exactly 40 years after the very day that our people in Haiti launched the Haitian Revolution. So if people, our family back then, understood this kind of connection and acted on it, I think today we have so much more access to information and to capacity to act in unison with people struggling all over the world to do the same. I have to uh, say greetings to uh, Brother Ralph Pointer and Sister Betty in the back. Every Tuesday they do a radio program and Brother Turner, uh, Nat Turner, starts the program uh, with poetry such as you heard today. And it's geared towards liberation of political prisoners. I mean, I don't know how many people in this room are connected to the struggle to free, not just Mubia, not just, you know, the high profile ones, Asco Lopez Rivera, but all of these political prisoners in, in the jails, people who are there for doing what many of us did not have or do not have today the courage to do. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very important. The, 
uh, one of the reasons I think that we were invited here. Uh, I'm a member of a group called Komokoda. It's the Committee to Mobilize Against Dictatorship in Haiti. And we connect dictatorship to, in Haiti to what's going on over here. Because we haven't had a dictator in Haiti that did not have the, <laughs> be, was not being supported by people over here. This is our reality. And uh, when uh, we started in 2014, we launched our movement. And we, we, we didn't know who was going to be against Clinton, but we knew Clinton was going to uh, go to be president. And we said, you know, <laughs> whatever it takes to stop this family from getting back to the White House over here, <laughs> let it happen. <laughs> connect that to what I was saying before, because for us it's not about salvaging this system. It's not about making it better. It's not about like, because I'm sitting here next to my brother, right? And I'm thinking, how many people, if, if he was the vice president now, right? How many, who here would be working in the Pentagon? <laughs> at, at CIA, you know? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, but what would you be doing in the Pentagon? Yeah. The Demolition work. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, and ICE, the deportations, you know? And uh, so, for us, people who understand that this government, this system needs to come down, needs to be destroyed for the world to live. So it's not about like, you know, voting someone who's not so bad, you know, who's gonna do a little bit, but to understand that it has to be taken down for the world to live. This is the reality. This is the reality. And Black Agenda has done so much uh, exposing the, uh, the Democrats, you know? <laughs> and the, uh, I don't know, like Trump, what are you gonna say about Trump, you know? But uh, by the way, we said to vote for Trump and we knew he was going to win, Margaret, because we understood that however bad that all of you can see that Trump is bad. For many of us, many people around the world, the Clintons have done more harm to us. Yes. Yeah. 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 You know, you know, the man the <laughs> And uh, they went to the heart of our people the, uh, because our country, it's people call it the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. We, we don't really know what that means. Because when we look at the United States, we say, this is rich. <laughs> <laughs> like, what do you have in terms of humanity? Like, who could, like, look at what this country is doing around the world and go on with your life? Yeah. And uh, so I think people have to reimagine the concept of who is rich, who is poor, what is rich, what is poor, okay? So I, I would really love for you guys to uh, take that notion very seriously and think about that when you see people around the world do things to people you might feel are innocent people. You see, really take that to heart because every mother cries for their children, you see? And we all bleed the same, wherever we are. And if you kill my son today, what is the Gil Scott Heron? Watch your back, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> because if I don't come today, I will come tomorrow. And if I cannot, my brother will, yeah. my sister will, yeah. somebody will, right? 
Right now, we are involved in this thing with the black misleaders who have decided that uh, Hillary Clinton should be the keynote speaker for the graduation of our kids at Medgar Evers College. Oh. Yeah. So this is happening next uh, Saturday, the 8th, at the Barclays Center, uh, 9 a.m., my son uh, is graduating there, along with um, the children of other members of our organization. But we, you know, we started protesting at Medgar Evers uh, last month, and uh, the the students, the staff, many of them didn't even know that this was the decision that Rudy Crew, if you don't know, is the president. Giuliani is all the water boy. Yeah. And uh, he, if you can imagine that uh, when the, we started protesting there and a lot of the students joined with us and they were mobilizing inside the school. And what does the school do? They announced that Medgar Evers' wife, who's now 84 years old, will be the one introducing Hillary Clinton on Saturday. That's elder abuse. <laughs> you see? And we, we understand when, and this is what I think Black Agenda means when they speak the Black Misleadership class. You have Monica Lewinsky business and Jesse Jackson goes to the White House to pray with Bill Clinton. The kids, what they understand is that someone who referred to them as dogs, who need to be brought to heal, this is the person that is being brought to give this commencement speech and that the school is honoring with a, a doctorate on that day. So we, 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 I mean, we don't need to go about the billions they stole in Haiti. We hope all of you know this. They didn't go to help Haiti, you know? <laughs> you know? The minimum wage, the, the sweatshops, you know, they, they stole money, billions of dollars. And you, you, you might laugh, but people in Haiti, we believe that the millions that were spent for their daughter's wedding came from earthquake relief money. You see? But this is what America represents to us. They are not anomalies, the Clintons. The Trumps of the world, they are not anomalies. When people around the world that are being oppressed, that are under the gun, we imagine America, we see America. This is the... The, I'll, I'll tell you guys a joke, you know, like when the earthquake happens, people who had a U.S. passport, you know, they ran however they could to get to the airport. And I have a sister, you know, who uh, uh, was in Haiti, you know, Haitian, born in Haiti, but has a U.S. passport, was there with a black American brother, and they rushed to the airport, and when they got there, you know, they, they went to the American line. The, the, the staff is like, hell no, you know, like, Americans, Americans. <laughs> and this is the, the just like, the, there is reality and there is perception. And I think that you guys have to, uh, you're not, uh, it's not that the people in this room are too small a group to wage a real fight, to make the reality that the world understands of people over here something else. Because you have to understand that right now, people see Trump as America. People see the Clintons as America. Not the people who are trying to do something a little better. And I think uh, this is a, a, a mission that, you know, would be good for uh, this group to take on. Thank you.
really cute Daoud, who was uh, a last minute add on, but it was well worth it to live. Because uh, all too often uh, in the white left movement, we hear so little about Haiti unless there is some kind of disaster. <laughs> I said that I was so happy that we were able to add on Daoud Andres at the last minute because all too often in the left, the white left, we hear so little about Haiti unless there is a disaster. And uh, the face of Haitian women and children are not generally seen as the face of the refugees here in this country. So another hard truth uh, for the uh, left. Uh, so uh, bear with me, I have some eyesight problems. Oh, our next two speakers are going to be um, Ajamu Baraka and Bruce Dixon. Oh, now before you leave, wait just a moment, Betty Davis and Ralph Pointer, who Daoud pointed out, these are two stalwarts of the movement, and these are the two people most responsible for getting Lynn Stewart out of jail. Okay, folks, our next two speakers again are going to be uh, Jamu Baraka and uh, Bruce uh, Dixon. Um, let me see if I can get this right here. Uh, Ajamu Baraka is an internationally recognized leader of the emerging human rights movement in the U.S. and has been uh, at the forefront uh, to apply the international human rights framework to social justice advocacy in the U.S. for more than 25 years. He's the former founding executive director of the U.S. Human Rights Network, uh, and that was until June of 2011. Baraka uh, currently serves as the national coordinator, uh, at the national organizer for the Black Alliance for Peace that seeks to recapture and redevelop the historic anti-war, anti-imperialist, and pro-peace position of the traditional black movement in the U.S. Uh, Baraka was uh, also the Green Party vice president candidate uh, in the 2016 uh, election along with uh, presidential candidate uh, Jill Stein. Last but not least is our managing editor, Bruce Dixon. Longtime activist, habitual troublemaker, <laughs> a habitual troublemaker and incorrigible activist, Bruce Dixon has been uh, comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable since 1968. As a rank and file member of the Black Panther Party from 1969 to 1970, he was a rank and file, he was also a rank and file uh, union activist in a string of factories, plants, and workshops, mostly in Chicago. Uh, Bruce is currently Bruce currently resides in Marietta, Georgia, and is a member of the Georgia State Committee of the Green Party. So welcome our last Thank you, Nellie, and thank, uh, thank you, uh, all the uh, members of this uh, table from the Black Agenda Report. Thank all of you for uh, packing into this room and uh, uh, bear with us in this heat. Um, it is indeed a pleasure and an honor to be here this afternoon and to be on this uh, uh, this platform. I'm so grateful that 
uh, Black Agenda Report allowed me to be a part of this since uh, I'm not as disciplined as my colleagues in terms of their ability to write on a regular basis and get those articles out. Um, I've been somewhat uh, uh, remiss, tardy, and just irresponsible for the last year or so, but I've been doing a few little things, so <laughs> I, I give myself a little excuse. excuse. Um, the one thing that I'm going to talk about, and I won't be long because we have, I think, made the sufficient points, and we do want to get to a, a point where we can have some dialogue in this room this afternoon. But the one thing I want to say that I think distinguishes the, the politics of Black Agenda Report and the politics of the Black Liberation Movement that they we're all a part of is the fact that we start from one very simple baseline position. And that is that we have to have in this country revolutionary change. start from that basic position that we are a captured people, that we are part of a prison house of nations, that we are uh, captive here in a settler colonial state, and that our responsibility is to not only struggle against this particular state, but to be in solidarity, fundamental solidarity with all oppressed people throughout the entire world. So we start from that position, that we have to have revolutionary change. And when you start from that position, then everything else, every other political question, are questions of strategy and tactics, including how we relate to and participate in the electoral process. For many of us, participating in the electoral arena is part of that process of building movement, building popular power is part of that process that allows us to engage the people to transform consciousness. So for us, that is the, the thrust of the electoral process. We say, well, why the Democrats we are, are, are concerned with? Well, as many of or all of the speakers have said, it is the Democratic Party that's been the main uh, impediment for us developing the kind of radical oppositional politics and consciousness we have to build. We understand where the Republicans come from, and we know that uh, most of the people in our communities understand where the Republicans are coming from and their social base. But it's been the Democrat Party that's been the source of ideological confusion. It's been the source of us being able, not being able to move the masses of our people away from sheer reformism to the kind of of radical politics that was developing in the 1960s and the 1970s. As many of you know, that one of the consequences of the repression in the 1970s was that it helped to uh, split off uh, the Black Liberation Movement from the emerging uh, motion that was put in place uh, by the Civil Rights Movement uh, and the emergence of this, this expanded black petty bourgeoisie. That when they began to target the black liberation movement, at the same time, they propped up this emerging element. These were the elements that, that basically decided that they were going to enter into the electoral process. They're the ones that ended up uh, taking over these uh, mayorships in various cities. They're the ones that aligned themselves with uh, the US state. They're the ones that called for uh, direct intervention uh, in black communities in the 1980s as part of the so-called uh, war on drugs. They're the ones that encouraged uh, Nixon to take up that, uh, that, uh, that, that slogan back in the 70s before that. Uh, they're the ones that were the, the base of the support uh, as the Democratic Party veered even more dramatically to the right in the 1990s. So it's this element that today we see uh, has, has, has jettisoned any pretext of being progressive and are now in complete and, com and total alignment with the most right-wing uh, expressions of the Democrat Party. They're the ones that, as Glenn and everybody has talked about, are now openly talking about Russia and Russian Gate, and now speaking to it any kind of way, 
the objective realities and needs of our people in this country and oppressed people around the world. That is why they, in fact, become the target. We can't move our people to a progressive place as long as that element continues to have some degree of ideological legitimacy. We have a number of very, I think, uh, clear uh, objectives. We have to look at the ideological component in terms of people understanding what it is we're up against and where we need to go. You know, last night I did, sister talked about the fact that if you uh, approach most people in this country and you ask them to define a term like neoliberalism, that most people wouldn't uh, understand or wouldn't be able to define that. And she's probably, uh, probably right. But what does that really mean? You know, we hear people talk about we need to start from where the people are at, okay? And we're all for that. But why is it in 2017, even among uh, progressives in many cases, even among our organizations and our organizational work, we don't have people who can understand and can define what neoliberalism might be or is. When you look at a place, for example, where I spend a, a lot of my time, in, in uh, Colombia, for example, I would challenge you to, 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 to go up to 10 people and ask them, 10 regular people, and ask them if they can define neoliberalism. And I would bet you at least six can. Now, what's the difference? The difference, my friends, is that in those political contexts, people are serious about ideological struggle. They're serious about political education. They understand and believe that people can think for themselves. Okay? And so we don't dumb down materials. We don't talk down the people. We engage in serious political education. Now, my point is that that is exactly what we have not been doing very effectively here in this country. That basically, if we don't have uh, a, a general understanding of neoliberalism with the impact that it has on all of our lives, then that's a reflection of our own contradiction, in my opinion, okay? So we have this ideological challenge. We have a political challenge in terms of now we've got to build and have an opportunity to build new and more powerful structures, okay? With people coming out of their relative stupor after eight years of being in this fall, uh, we have a chance now to really begin to build new mass movements. We have a programmatic challenge. That is, what is it that we need to begin to focus in on that can really sharpen the contradictions, that can really uh, 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 sharpen the crisis that the, the bourgeoisie is involved in right now? I say that that one programmatic <coughs> position, that one political position we, need, we should be trying to uh, exploit is the need on the part of the bourgeoisie to use the weapon of war to advance its interests. <clears throat> now is the time for us to revive a powerful anti-war movement here in this country. <clears throat> it's also the time, my friends, to, our, to connect that, that anti-war sentiment with a more clear, explicit, deep understanding of imperialism. That movement has to be anti-imperialist also. We see the consequence of the, of the confusion among our, 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 our ranks when it comes to when our states are in the crosshairs of U.S. imperialism. You know, most of us in this room have been around long enough that basically when a state was in the crosshair of U.S. imperialism, we stood with that particular state. <coughs> Despite whatever issues or contradictions we may have identified in that particular state. The very fact that they are in the crosshairs of U.S. imperialism suggests that maybe something they're doing is correct. <laughs> <laughs> because we know from the history of this country that the U.S. has never been on the side of the people. So why the confusion today? We understand that we are here in an oppressor state. And despite, again, the contradictions we're looking at oppressed nations. And that if you don't stand with that oppressed nation, 
then basically you are objectively aligning yourself <coughs> with U.S. imperialism. That is backward, we have to reject that. We say that this issue of war has to be the, the, the main issue. Uh, we have to link that issue of war and anti-imperialism uh, with the issue of domestic repression. And basically, for us, as we organize, we can't just organize the anti-war and anti-imperialist component. We've got to connect that to the fact that we're up against a repressive state that's involved in the systematic uh, repression of any of us, and all of us, who are about trying to advance a progressive agenda. Okay? So this is the time for us to begin to rebuild uh, this anti-war, anti-imperialist, uh, pro-peace movement. But we understand that, you know, without justice, there will be no peace. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be prepared to engage in a, 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 a struggle, a fierce struggle. But we have the, the, the conditions and we have the times uh, with us today. All we need now is the will, the, the, the courage to, in fact, do what needs to be done. And now is the time to do it. Hey there, I'm Bruce Dixon uh, from Black Agenda Report. Um, I gotta start out by apologizing. Uh, first to all of you, um, I was one of the people who was supposed to be doing arrangements beforehand. And perhaps if I had been better on the job, I would have gotten this bigger room. <laughs> uh, also, I bungled uh, the, the uh, participant list and biographies and the rest of it, leading to all kinds of trouble. And that's um, a problem. I mean, I owe each of the people here um, at Black Agenda Report uh, a lot. Uh, their work, uh, in great part, is why I'm here. And so uh, I owe each of you individually and collectively an apology for that. And uh, we'll talk some more. Um, anyway, uh, the theme here uh, is how resisting Trump is not enough. When you hear about the resistance to Trump, you hear a lot of this um, stuff that can only be characterized as, uh, what, the old-fashioned 1930s United Front stuff, right? <laughs> when has that ever led to a victory for the left. I mean, if you believe that there's lessons in history, find me that one, please. I'll wait. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and anyway, the United Front is really not united. Uh, that's a myth, that's a joke. I live in Georgia, in the 6th Congressional District, Newt's old district, the district where right now the most expensive congressional race in history uh, is going on. The district is only 10% black, but they want every black vote out the Democrats do because for obvious reasons. You know. And um, they had an affair there a week ago today. And um, I had, I was notified of it, and somebody asked if the Green Party, the Black Agenda Report, would endorse it. And I said, well, are you going to put us on the panel? And they said, well, we're reaching out to put Susan Sarandon on the panel. <laughs> and I feel mean, she's an expert, right? She lives in Canada where they have paper ballots, right? So that makes her an expert at election integrity. I mean, I, I ran field operations for campaigns for 25 years in Chicago, but I'm not an expert. You, you know what they said to our request? They said, you're political. <laughs> okay. All right, you know. So, so, so that's how united the United Front is, you know. And so what we need to be, what we need to be is we need to be real visionaries about this. Like, like Brother John who said, we don't need to dumb anything down. We don't need to dumb anything down. If somebody asks you to explain something, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. You know, if you talk to folks and nothing needs an explanation, that might be a problem right there. Mm -hmm. That might be a bad sign. You know, and, and anyway, we need to have visionary demands. Um, I'll sketch out four places where there are possibilities for <coughs> visionary demands. One of them is, we hear a lot about election integrity here. There's, I think there's six, count them, six workshops on election integrity here in this 
uh, left for him this weekend. But you know what would sweep all the voter ID laws off the table at once? Okay, you know what would invalidate um, all the voter caging and and the nonsense about uh, 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 black box voting? A constitutional amendment guaranteeing the right to vote. The right to vote is not guaranteed in the Constitution. And no wrong, no, and, and, and the legal system in this country is based on Constitution worship, okay? If it's in the Constitution, we can't touch it. And the only thing we can do is interpret the Constitution. And if it's not in the Constitution, which the right to vote, which the right to vote is not, any sheriff, any mayor, any governor, any legislature, any election official, any county official can make a rule that interferes with your right to vote. I was an activist in the 70s and 80s. We discussed that then. And what Democrats said is, no, 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 no. Maybe the Constitution is hard. You know? <laughs> we need to concentrate on electing good people, and the Supreme Court will take care of us. As long as we take care of you know, and, and like, okay, you see, you see where that got us, okay? You see where that got us. They had the moral high ground for a generation from which they might have launched a drive to amend the Constitution to guarantee the right to vote, okay? Who could speak against the right to vote in the 80s? Who? Who in the 70s? Who directly in the 90s? But now, hey, they got it. So that's one area. Another area is gentrification. Now look here. Uh, the, the neighborhood I grew up in, in Chicago, is the neighborhood where the Olympics would have been. Everybody I knew in Chicago had a party the night they turned away the Olympics from Chicago. <laughs> All right? <laughs> and, you know, and, and think about gentrification now. It's been the only economic <clears throat> development model ever introduced for urban America. There, it's mm -hmm. like Margaret Thatcher used to say, there is no alternative. Okay? And why? Not because they're bad people, per se, but because, which, which they are, thank you. <laughs> but, but, but that's not why. That's not the cause. That might be an effect, you know. But, but the cause is, well, you know, what, do property, what happens to property values when people of African descent are in the area? Those property values are automatically lowered, okay? What value does a stable, working-class neighborhood in the United States have? None, except the value that you can realize by flipping it, okay? So as long as we have capitalism, gentrification is friggin' inevitable, okay? So when you fight gentrification, you're fighting capitalism. So we've got to double down on that. And we got to say it just like I said. It. It's an inevitable product of the economic system of capitalism. You can't get around it unless you can, which hey, you can. Another um, area is, of course, as Ajamu and Glenn talked about, ending the wars. There can't be any compromise or any middle ground on that. Um, this, you know, we live in the center of empire and to oppose the wars is to oppose what these things are fundamentally <coughs> about. I live in Marietta, Georgia. Uh, the same Marietta that uh, is the home of Lockheed. <laughs> All right. So um, Enough said on that. Uh, the, final, the final area that we need to be ambitious about are demands on, which I never hear talked about on the left. Never. You guys are supposed to be socialists. But you never talk about labor rights and the right to strike. Right now, right now, uh, public employees in most of the country are banned from striking. It's illegal. Right now, it's illegal to do a sympathy strike. It's illegal to do some boycotts. And it's illegal, and definitely the general strikes are illegal everywhere in the world, you see. And right now, we need to be fighting for the right of workers to withhold their labor any damn time they please. And, and we don't 
need to be fighting for it the way lawyers fight for it. Okay? The way lawyers fight for it is, I, I heard a guy on Doug Henwood's show uh, a little while ago. He's the one who actually reminded me of this, you know, a few weeks ago. Doug Henwood show is behind the news. Google it. It's indispensable, you know. Um, but but what, what lawyers do is they are trained to worship the Constitution. And so they say, well, we're going to restore labor rights by reinterpreting the Constitution. No, 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 no. What we've got to do if we're the left is we got to figure out new ways to creatively violate those anti-labor laws until we get ones that work for us. So those are the kind of ambitious demands that the left needs to do instead of this milquetoast garbage that <laughs> the United Front wants you to do. Yeah. Um, uh, my next to last point is that We've been right politically a lot. But where are we? But we're still relatively small and relatively marginal in many ways. What does that tell us? What it, what it might tell us is that we have the right politics, but we don't necessarily have the right tools, the right organization, you know, the right organizational methodologies. You know, I'm part of the Green Party. And uh, we're going to have a workshop in this room right after this one where we talk about some of that. But um, what we need are sustainable, internally democratic organizations that can stick around for the long term. And some of us are about trying to refashion the Green Party into a mass membership party of the left, such as we not, have not had since the heyday of the Socialist Party a century ago. You know, and we think we can do it uh, in part. One of the big pieces of it is transforming that organization into a membership dues paying organization where the members pay dues and they're the only ones who can elect officers and, and that. We're charging 10 bucks a month for dues in Georgia <clears throat> with a sliding scale that slides upwards. I mean, really, if you, I mean, I've been poor and even the poor people can move, even poor folks can move around 10 bucks in a month. Please, you know, and if you can't, then that's all right. We'll still be our friend. You know, we'll still love you. you know. But, but, but like I said, we need to redream our organizational you know, things, how we do that. Finally, Black Agenda Report will be 11 years old in October. Is that right? Mm -hmm. 2006. Yes. Mm -hmm. October 2006. Um, we haven't asked you for money much in that time, you know, not because we didn't need it, but because we're just not good at that yet. You know, we're good at doing what we've done, but we're trying to get good at some other things. And so we're going to be asking you for money a lot more persistently and consistently than we have before. We're going to be asking you to forward our our emails. Is anybody here not on Black Agenda Reports email list? Holy shit. <laughs> How did that happen? I don't know why you didn't either, but um, oh God. Hey Bruce. Hey, I'm Bruce. the guy walking. We've got two more minutes okay. and we're going to do the Black Agenda Report. Okay. One more minute. Um all right, well I'm gonna have a book that you can sign um, to put you know, your address here in, so you can get on our email list, please include your mailing address, your snail mail address, and a phone number, please. We won't abuse your privacy. We won't do that. You know, and um, <laughs> hey, that's it. That's all I had. Thank you all for this. This brings us to our uh, Q&A period, and uh, I want you to raise your hands. We don't have uh, a lot of time here, and please, no speeches. Okay, let's uh, start uh, here with um, you, and then we'll go to the other side of the room with Suzanne, and we're going to take three. We're going to do it in, in three. Is there anyone else on this side of the room? Uh, no, and then we'll go to the gentleman in the black t-shirt with his hand up. 
Okay, so let's start. Yes. Um, Why don't you stand up sure. so you can... First off, thank you very much. Second off, um, what I've heard from the panel as far as war goes, uh, obviously we have to stop it, but there's such a huge incentive for both the Republicans and Democrats to keep it going because, number one, as we all know, war is a racket, and number two... Hey, folks, hey, folks, please, please, we, this is Q&A. Uh, if you want to pass out cards, you can get to the door or whatever. But let's have some respect for the people who are talking and asking the questions, please. And for the people in the door, in the doorway, you can come in and move to the back. Okay, please and go number ahead. Number two, it's a uh, it's a uh, diversionary tactic. Who cares about uh, clean water when you got a gun to your head? So, and then if. If someone protests, I, I wasn't live around the 68, so I don't know that much, but I know from my dad. Um, if you protest, then you're the threat sometimes. So how how do we combat that past? The pro how do we get it into everyone's consciousness that the wars have to stop? Beyond the physical protests, how do we how do we intellectually get people to realize that? Okay, and the speaker over here, please. Yeah. Um, you want to stand, please, so yeah. we can see. I very much appreciate the analysis that was offered here, and I agree with everything that was said, more or less. Um, but I want to kind of maybe try to reframe a bit uh, some of the issues that were raised. Um, to me somebody who came of age politically in the 1960s, this is the largest spontaneous mass upsurge <laughs> since then that I've seen or that I think has existed. And the question is, expose the Democrats, how is that going to happen? In my opinion, it has to happen through struggle around the needs of people, the daily needs of people, the issue of war and anti-war, and I'd like to get a reaction. Now, this, to me, the starting point is the largest mass upsurge of protests. Yeah, the, the antecedents were there, Black Lives Matter, women's liberation, immigration, but how do we do that? Okay, next question. Over here, was there someone else? I recognize three hands, was there? All right, so let's have a third one, uh, over here. Yeah, gent, yeah? Um, I, I think that the idea that you know, we're going forward for example, you know, about gender education and labor rights as a focus, as well as, of course, criminal justice reform in the new Jim Crow. But the, one of the, the question of the method and, and getting a mass movement, it would seem one of the things that groups like the Green Party could do is to put together ballot measures, because you don't have to have a huge number of people to get a ballot measure on the ballot in those states that have it like Massachusetts and California. Okay. Is there a question there? I was wondering if the idea that we would like to go to that track is being pursued by the Okay, well, Bruce Dixon is outside, but we'll relate that to him. So, can we get a uh, response to those two questions that were asked? And we'll ask Bruce to come in. Please, Glenn? Yeah, I, I guess I'm going to respond with the question to the gentleman who was talking about this uh, largest mass upsurge of protest. Uh, th this is this is a protest and a and a movement uh, for or anti what? For uh, women's rights, for abortion rights, for Black Lives Matter, anti-police repression, uh, all of the spontaneous upsurge.